The TMPCC, or the Television and Motion Picture Car Club, hosts a 4th of July party every year at the CBS studio lot in Hollywood. It's a family-friendly atmosphere, and you will see some pretty amazing cars and personalities here. Come on in, let me show you. Hi there, my name is Gary Wells, and I'm from Woodland Hills, California. We came out today to uh, the studio here to enjoy a wonderful 4th of July, and I brought my little baby with me. It's uh, 240 inches long, so it's 20 feet long. It's 14 liters, 900 cubic inches, and we call it the Beast. And you'll never guess why. This is the Beast. It's six cylinder, 900 cubic inches, 14 liters. It will do 100 miles an hour. I've had it to 80, but I kind of run out there at that point. But it's a lot of fun. And the object behind the build of this machine is that it's my salute to the great racing cars of the heroic age, which is right around the turn of the century. And people uh, really don't see anything like this much on the road anymore. And the object is when people walk up to this car, they smile. That's the whole thing. That's what we want them to do. I hope today to share this with thousands and thousands of people. Oh, it handles beautifully. Yeah. There's no problem handling the car. It's, you're, you're very high up, you're seven feet up in the air, and it has a wide stance. If you can tell by the size of these wheels, when they're turning, you're moving. It seems that we cannot drive this on the road without people just coming by and all you see is people going click, click, taking movies with their camera. This we did in elephant hide, legal elephant hide, I might add. It just, it's just, everything is over the top. This is chain drive. So the original sprocket was this size. We bumped it up to here. So that puts the car at over hundred miles an hour. Now all this unique, interesting looking stuff, that's the speedometer drive that used to be on the front wheels, but since it is as big as it is, it weighs about 7,000 pounds, we had to put uh, uh, power disc brakes on the front. And also we have power steering on the car, so it really does go and handle. If someone would cut me off really fast and hit the brakes, they're just another bump in the road. What can I tell you? We try to drive very defensively, not always lucky, but most of the time we are. But it's a great deal of fun, and uh, please look at the car, look at all the things, and you see why we call it La Bistione. We were with Jay Leno a couple of weeks ago, and he drove it and he put it on his Jay Leno's garage. We had a great deal of fun, but we, I call him Mr. America Car Guy, and he really is. He's a, a true enthusiast on the automobiles, and we drive these things, and let me tell you, Jay got right in it, boom, boom, no problem at all. Now, let me tell you, it's intimidating. I don't care who you are. That's an intimidating car. It's a six-cylinder. Let me show you that. This is worth the... Worth the look. These are three Siamese blocks. 
They are, uh, each piston is the size of a two pound coffee can and it's, it's a low revving car, obviously. We only do about 1,200 RPM, but at 1,200 RPM, you're doing between 80 and 100 miles an hour in third gear. You have three forward gears, one reverse gear. And most people, when they walk up, they go, oh, chitty, chitty, bang, bang. Well, I take that as a great compliment. My name's Gordon Tronson and I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada and I, as you can see I'm quite a hot rod nut. Uh, I've been playing around with hot rods since I was probably uh, 14, 15 and uh, I own about 29 cars at home and of various kinds from Lamborghinis, Ferraris, muscle cars, old cars, you name it, motorcycles and I'm always looking for something different to do. Actually it's funny everybody asks me that, my line of work is actually telecommunications and electrical. Uh, but I just have a passion for automotive, anything that makes a sound and moves, I'm interested. I actually build my own hot rods and unfortunately I don't sell them and that's why I've got a bit of a collection. <laughs> my favorite saying is uh, Enzo Ferrari once said, uh, somebody asked him which was his favorite Ferrari and he said the one I haven't built yet. This is definitely one of a kind, it's uh, based on a 1927 Model T Ford which basically is only the body. The rest is a tube chassis, Jag, Jag rear end, made all the front suspension. And of course, the, uh, the big point about this has got two engines instead of one. Uh, these are both uh, Hemi Fords that uh, come out of the Mark 8 Lincolns and the Super Cobras. I went a little bit step further. Instead of putting one supercharger on each engine, I put four. We're looking at about 1,200 horsepower, uh, which we haven't really figured out yet because I'm too damn scared to put my foot in it. <laughs> The 27 uh, actually started hot rodding way back in the 30s, 40s. One of the very first uh, hot rods that came about was actually based on the Model T. And then I went to the Model A and then the 32 and the 34 and the 36 and so on. Uh, when, when everybody talks about hot rods, it's usually in the 30s. Today's world, it's pretty cool because uh, all the stuff that's available to everybody, even the young kids, the old kids, uh, or whatever, there's a lot of stuff out there now and uh, use your imagination, you can build whatever you want. This car here in particular, I just about handmade everything I could. Uh, very, very few parts went outside of my you know, garage uh, to get fabricated, I try to do all my own, you know. These actually have modern 2000 engines in them, yet I took all the uh, electronics away and went back to old school supercharger with a holly carburetor and it's even got, uh, for the uh, distributors, I'm using 1939 Ford Flathead reproduction distributors. Everybody's got some talent. I'm con totally convinced of that. Everybody actually has a hidden talent. Some just take a little bit longer to find it. <laughs> some don't find it. Uh, just uh, ever since I was a kid, I was just playing around with stuff, you know, building things. Usually I would take something apart and then put it back together just to see how it worked and that's always been my interest, is how stuff works. My name is Ed Iskandarian. 
and uh, we we got started in this uh, hot rod. We didn't call them hot rods then. We called them uh, gal jobs or hot iron. I was born in '21, so when I was about 19, 12, or 13, we'd notice these a little stripped down Model T would come by. This kid had tried, the guys had made it sort of into a racing car, one or two men inside. Well, we'd seen them go by like that, but never seen one stop. Finally, someone told us where the guy lives, and we went over and looked at it, and the guy explained how he'd build it up from parts from the junkyard. It's a Model T stripped down as much as possible for lightweight, because it's only a 20 horsepower engine and they uh, had certain speed equipment to hop them up a little bit. And uh, you want to see a lot of these? Yeah, where? Well, up at the Muroc Dry Lake, 100 miles from Los Angeles out in the desert. Yeah, yeah. And sure enough, we get a ride in a rumble seat or something. Here they are. By golly, there's hundreds of them up here at Muroc Dry Lake. We drive up all night and then uh, sleep on the desert try to sleep, but there's a lot of guys that are excited and they start their car up at night and even try it out in the dark. They're crazy guys, you know. Well, uh, daylight comes and now it gets warm and uh, boy, the, we didn't realize it, but our little section of town with two or three hot rods, why other sections of uh, Southern California they came from all other parts that we didn't know about. So, so we learn a lot more by looking at them. They're in line, ready to make a run, you know. <clears throat> and the, the guys, uh, they'll usually tell you how they hopped it up. What they, why did you do this? Why did you do that? What kind of an axle is that? Oh, that's off of a Franklin. It's a nice looking axle. And uh, Cadillac pressure pumps for pumping on the gasoline and stuff. We had to learn about this stuff from the older fellows that were doing it, you see, because there was no literature or anything we could read about it. Oh, this would be about 1937 or 36, maybe. We'd get ideas. We'd like to build one up, too. So usually, you, sometimes you could buy Model, A's, Model T's uh, for 5 or $10 sitting in the vacant lot and take it home and try and get it running, you know. We learned from the older fellas how to do things. The, the engine was pretty simple and you almost didn't need any instructions to work on it, you know. As I see the new generation, things have gotten very expensive. <clears throat> I think these young fellas uh, don't realize even with a stock engine, they can have a lot of fun by hopping it up without spending a lot of money. And instead of boring and stroking it, leave it stock and uh, on the bore and stroke and uh, go into carburation and camshaft and they'll, they'll have a lot of fun that way. Now a lot of the fellows went into the service in World War II and they got to work on uh, and sometimes they'd get into mechanics and they'd get to work on uh, some pretty heavy equipment and they learned more. And they came back with quite a bit of knowledge Everybody, everybody came home with a lot more knowledge yeah, yeah. and uh, wanting to uh, have fun up there and try and set records and so forth. And that's when I decided I had bought my first cam from Ed Winfield. He was born in 19, uh, 1900 and he was a self-taught engineer, probably one of the foremost uh, experts on racing engine in the, in the world at that time. And he showed me his machine he had made, the cam grinding machine. And I was fascinated by that. And, and that's when I decided I'd like to try that. I went to an auction and bought a cylindrical grinding machine for grinding round shafts and modified it with a cam grinding attachment and uh, started experimenting with cams, you know. Somehow I'd got the idea that fast action would be a good idea. And I'll leave the clearance ramps off. I'll almost be slapping the valves open. They were a little hard to sell because you don't have a reputation, you see. If you had someone that went fast at the dry lakes, 
they would buy your cam. So I went to speed shops and uh, they weren't interested because they figured you couldn't know much about cab. You're just a kid that races the dry lakes. But uh, Carl Orr's speed shop, he kind of took pity on me and bought a couple. And Anson Automotive with Jack Andrews and Louis Centers, they had started uh, Anson Automotive and, and they'd buy them. And I really didn't know I had anything until uh, NASCAR, who was running Flatheads uh, back east on the racetrack, they had called up one day. They saw my ad, little ad in Hot Rod Magazine, a two-inch ad for $10, a, uh, $10. And they bought two cams by airmail. And uh, years later, I found out by Bob Osika came out and visited, and he told me, we tried to keep it secret that your cameras would go out there on the racetrack and had a lot of mid-range power and would pass cars, whereas the super cams, which were made for top end only, they they uh, had top end power but not much in the mid range. But when I got one on the circle race tracks, where they're going around and around these race tracks, if a little spot opened up, mine would uh, have enough power to pass a car and work your way to the front <clears throat> because of my fast action. Hi, my name is Joel Grusin. I'm out of Lakewood, California. And today we're here at Studio Cities, CBS Studios, for the uh, annual TMC, TMPCC car show. Our 1923 T Ford T Roadster, which is a uh, tribute car to a guy by the name of Gary Cagle, who raced a car similar to this in 1963 through 1968. Oh, the car is strictly show. Uh, we do startups on it because it runs on nitromethane, so it makes a little bit of noise. So a lot of the car shows we go to, we have the young kids that are primarily Honda and Toyota and Mazda types, and when they see these big blown V8s, they're not sure what they're looking at because they only equate four-cylinder motors. And we were at a car show a couple of years ago with this. And when we started it up and switched it over to the nitromethane, the change in tone and demeanor of the car really changes. And these kids, their eyes got big as frying pans. I used to guinea pig when I was younger. And there was a speed shop in Riverside that the guy who built the car was having trouble getting it down the track for one reason or another and he asked me if I would race it to see what I thought. Well, he was a big dude and as you see I'm a statuesque five foot six and a half and I get into the car and I'm sitting like this and I'm looking out this way and the car is facing this way and the only reason I know I got to the finish line is because the flags were across there and I just shut it down, almost went up the side of the bank, but it was interesting. When you see the stuff on TV, on ESPN, the NHRA races, yeah, that's pretty much corporate. Uh, what we do is kind of grassroots now uh, with the nostalgia movement. And you have a lot of guys that uh, are fairly well healed in the pocket. And then you have guys like myself who don't know when to quit, when to quit you know, we just, you know, Honey, did you pay the rent? Good, let's buy some fuel for the car, you know. But there's a lot of ingenuity that goes into some of the cars that are racing nostalgia now. Uh, they're updated, we don't have the muffler molly chassis anymore, and some of the crazy stunts that we did back then you don't do anymore, so safety's a big factor in it. Sure, if you enjoy drag racing, and if you 
can think back 40 or 50 years, come on out to the next a nostalgia race, one in August at Famoso, another one in October at Famoso Raceway in Bakersfield. See you at the, see you at the races, you can't miss it.